Yo, good morning. Yes, and welcome to another episode of Book Club with Caden Kelly, a podcast where I read books. That sounds like a sounds like a podcast. A book, a, a podcast called Book Club would probably be about reading books, right? And that's what we do. We read books, nonfiction books, self help books, finance books, philosophy books, all with the intention to help improve our health, our wealth, our wisdom, and our peace. This podcast keeps me accountable to read the books and to learn the info and to digest it and to apply it to my life, to understand it really well. Um, And then sharing it on a podcast, you know what that does? It gives you the opportunity to digest the info as well and improve your life. Uh, I do it in several different facets, different ways. I do the podcast. I write in a blog. I make little TikTok videos. I'm getting a bunch of, bunch of, uh, I'm regurgitating the info several times. So go to my blog if you like. If you want to get more content like this, and you want to get access to the TikToks, and uh, you want to join this podcast live because we're live right now. It's December twelfth, ten twenty three a.m. Mountain Standard Time. We do this live on Mondays. You can join us by going to my blog, Caden Kelly's blog dot wordpress dot com, and joining going to the YouTube, Facebook, or Twitch following me and turning on your notifications when we go live. I'm usually live Mondays in the morning-ish times. And you can share your thoughts on these crazy books with the crazy content, and it's always a good time. So go to the you go to the blog. It has links to the socials as well. has links to – well, and then it has all the, the blog stuff that I post. So you get everything. You get everything on the blog. Uh, yeah, and that's it, man. So we do a lot of that crap around here to help us, you know – because the whole point of doing all this is to help us be better people, and if you if you want to if we want to start this on a philosophical note, we're all gonna die, and we could die at any moment. Any of us could die at any moment, but death is certain for all of us. And so, what are we supposed to do until we die? Well, I it, so I was having this conversation with my girlfriend, and we were we were we were saying, you know, if. Uh, well, if that's the case, then why don't we just abandon all of our responsibility and go do a bunch of drugs and party and stop going to work and blow our money and blah, blah, blah. And you could say, well, you don't know when you're going to die. And yeah, that's pretty much the case. But I think the I think the deeper and the more appropriate response to death, to all of us dying at some point, is not to neglect our responsibility, but to take extreme responsibility. Today, right now, we should live our life Every we should live every moment with we should we should be grateful for every moment we have. And we should also um, consider that this might be the only the last chance to do or to, to tell someone that we care about them or to do the thing that we're like to do what's important to us. It could be the last. So instead of like, you know, instead of going to do a bunch of drugs and because you're going to die. Why don't you go do what is the most important thing to you? And I guess some people like drugs the most, but does, do drugs make you the happiest person ever? Do they satisfy your life? Um, do they satisfy the craving for curiosity? And and uh, anyway, I didn't finish that on a very strong note, but that's that's where we're, that's where we're going, right? So uh, yeah, we listen to we read these books and we do the podcasts and I and uh, you know what. This is all with the you know, with with the idea that yeah we're all gonna die someday. So all we the best thing we can do is to live the best life that we can today, and I think that looks like being responsible, being as responsible as we can today. Reading the books, doing the podcast, write the blog, tell your partner you love them, your parents, your siblings, your your best friends, your kids, tell them you love them. Show up to your job, do your absolute best at your job. Show up for your family. Do your absolute best for your family. Show up for yourself. Go to the gym and do the reading and the writing and do the absolute best for yourself because, yeah, because we're going to die someday. I don't know. I was, think, I was thinking about it. last. We were talking about it last night. I've been thinking about it this morning. We're all going to die, so let's do the absolute best in this very moment that we can today and enjoy it wherever we're at in life. Enjoy it because, you know, you're uh, – uh, now, I don't have a lot of time to ramble because I read a book and it was a long book and I got a so many notes. So I'm just going to leave the philosophy there, even though I, I have more I want to say. I'm going to leave it right there. So let's get into it, man, and women and non-binary people. Last week, we read a book called 21 Lessons 
for the 21st Century by Yuval Noah Harari. Uh, this is the third installment in his series of humans and human behavior and life and all of that. And it's not like a trilogy. It's, you know, it's it's more just his the first his first book, Sapiens, very popular. His second book, Homo Deus. And, and then uh, that so Sapiens was about. Oh, right here. It says on the back of this book. Man, this is awesome. I didn't even realize. This is not scripted. In Sapiens, Yuval Noah Harari explored our past. In Homo Deus, he looked into the future. And we've covered both of those episodes, so you can search them and go, go listen to Sapiens and Homo Deus. Now, one of the most innovative thinkers on the planet turns to the present to make, this, make sense of today's most pressing issues. So, today, yeah, um... So that's it, man. That, and so we talked about the past. He's talking about the future. Now he's talking about the present and how, uh, you know, what we can do to live our m- the most meaningful lives, have be the best people we can be. It's very philosophical and it's very scientific and it's historical. Let me tell the homie's a historian. Let me tell you about Yuval. And here's his picture from the book. Always blurry because it doesn't autofocus, but that's fine. Yuval Noah Harari is a Ph.D., has a Ph.D. in history from the University of Oxford and now lectures at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, specializing in world history. His two previous books, Sapiens and Homo Deus, have become global bestsellers with more than 12 million copies sold in translations in more than 45 languages. It's it's very impressive. And the book, those books are awesome. I, I usually credit Sapiens to being my exit out of the church, out of the Mormon church. (laughs) <laughs> and it kind of was, you know, I, it was like, it was the first book I read when I came home from my mission. I, I don't know how I found it or why it was the one that stood out to me, but it was, it folk probably because it was so popular, it was just put in my face by all the algorithms, but homie in, in, uh, um, I think you wrote that in like 2009 or something or 10 homo deus came out, I think in 2015 and this one was published in 2018. So, homie, uh, yeah, when I came home from my mission, I had, you know, I had, I had some personal experiences. I don't, again, I, I don't have, a, I want to focus mostly on this book, but I'll, I will say I had some con- contradicting thoughts on my mission about church doctrine and, and science and whatever. And I came home and I read this book. I read that book, Sapiens, and it opened my, it opened my mind to a whole different perspective of the world and of life and behavior and um i learned that i'm really actually very interested in human behavior why we behave the way we behave uh what influences it how we can be how uh why people behave differently than others how we can improve our behavior and uh his he as a historian he draws up on tons of different experiences from many many different corners of the world through tons and tons of different, you know, through hundreds to thousands of years of human history. So uh, he's got a lot to say, and he's very wise. I really enjoyed, I've enjoyed all of his books. So I've got a ton of notes. Uh, um, and if, you know, you know, if you've been here before, you know, I read the book, I take notes. This is another way for me to digest the info, and then I talk about it, and then I write about it, and then I make TikToks about it. I get all, I do a, all sorts of different ways to help understand the content. So here we're going to try to digest what we've learned. So here's 21 lessons for the 21st century. Introduction. Okay, yeah, his first book discusses how humans came to rule the world. His second book was that humans may become gods. That's what homo deus means. And this book is about current world affairs, what are today's greatest challenges, and what should we pay attention to, and how should we teach, and what should we teach our kids. Uh, to look at the major influences in the world through a selection of lessons. So that's what this book is. A result of technology taking over jobs doesn't threaten a personal security. It threatens their relevancy. Okay, so this book's broken down into five parts. And I'll tell you what they are really quickly. Let me open up the contents. Part one, the technological challenge. Part two, the political challenge. Part three, despair and hope. Part four, truth. And part five, resilience. Honestly, if I were to be honest, I could, I should do an hour episode for each part. That's how much, you know, 
awesome content there is. There's about five chapters for each part. The book was about a 12-hour audio book. So it wasn't the longest book we've done, but just so much very rich content. And I shouldn't say... So yeah, so the there are five parts, but there's 21 chapters. Yeah, so there's not five chapters apart. There's 21 chapters total. Each chapter is a lesson. And they're all really s- nicely organized on the back of the book. Um, I'm not going to read them all because we're going to go talk about, we're going to talk about all of them. So let's get to it. Yeah. So that last note, he says, he, uh, a result of technology taking over jobs doesn't threaten a person's security. It threatens their relevancy. So the part one is the technological challenge. It's a very, this and it echoes a lot of what he talked about in Homo Deus, because Homo Deus was how smart humans have become and how we've, you know, we've created these sophisticated technologies and algorithms that are capable, are, are increasing in capacity, their ability to do anything, to do just about everything. And things, you know, and it's just innovation after innovation. So that book was like, AI might become so sophisticated that it might become better than humans at everything. And so why would humans do anything if robots and AI could do it better than us? So here's so he kind of echoes a lot of on a lot of that. Chapter one, disillusionment. Liberalism is facing a crisis today like it has in the past against communism and fascism. Uh, Trump and Brexit aren't anti-globalists, but as he describes, as Harari describes, they these guys. Trump and Brexit think that everyone else should figure out their own problems and globalism is not their responsibility. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, I said this sort of sounds like Wheel, Jamie Wheel from Reca- Recapture the Rapture, arguing that we are losing meaning in the world. So liberalism faces a crisis today like it did in the past. Liberalism has, has succeeded against fascism and communism. But uh, you know who know like it'll always be challenged. There will always there there will there should always be things to challenge our current way of living because uh, we don't have all the answers. We don't have it figured out. And what did Ch- what did Winston Churchill said? Um, he said democracy is the worst thing for humans, but it's the best. It's the best thing that we've got, or something like that. It's the worst form of anyway. Some I could find it. I should find it. Uh, let's see, Churchill democracy quote democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others that have been tried that's from blogs.fcdo.gov.uk so that seems pretty winston churchill once said democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others that have been that have been tried uh going on uh just talking about this quote this is from that website his cynicism was perhaps justified after the british people voted him out of his position as prime minister within months of winning the second world oh okay no they're not explaining so okay yeah i don't need to spend a ton of time we got to keep going it is easier to build a dam to stop a river from flowing than it is to consider all of the possible consequences of doing such likewise we are doing that by integrating ai uh and our big decision making amongst other technological innovations. Yeah, and he talks about this down the road. It's e- like our um as humans, it's easier for us to simplify problems and to, you know, to do something than it is to to slow down and consider hundreds if not thousands of consequences of making decisions. So we're at this we're at a uh, we're at a point in our history where we have incredible amounts of technology and and um capacity for technology to integrate into our lives like for example amazon has that grocery store in washington i think and where you there's no nobody works there maybe there's a couple people that work there but nobody's scanning groceries what happens is you go to the grocery you go to the store you get a cart and you log in there's a computer on the cart and you log into your own amazon account and when you grab milk and you put it into the cart the cart senses that you put it in there what the item was and it you know it just charged or it adds it to the cart right as it check checks it off and you grab eggs and you grab cheetos and you grab apples and it just the cart is tallying the order and then when you're done when you're done shopping instead of going to a checkout place 
you just push the cart out the building and boom, your Amazon account is charged. And then you go put them in your car. And that's an awesome thing. But but uh, uh, what the point that he's made, the philosophy here is we are so eager to innovate and to integrate to advances into our into our life um, without cons- without working on or considering all possible consequences of doing this. So uh, that's that's the point. We can move on. That's enough. That's enough there. Quote, it is much harder to struggle against exploitation than it is irrelevance. Yeah, this point of irrelevancy that he makes is um, like the sh- like the uh, the shopping, the store example. Um, a struggle that working people have that humans have suffered from in the past has been exploitation from their government and from their corporations, from their bosses uh, to, you know, to bring wages down or to work extra hours or to do with to dealing with uh, un- uh, unjust working circumstances or situations. But now that's shifting from AI and computers taking over our jobs, right? The, glo- the grocery clerk is doesn't have a job at this Amazon store. There's no store managers. There's Really, there's only like people that are working on the shopping cart computers and making sure all the things are up to date. There's engineers behind the scenes now. You don't have grocery store clerks. And you don't have managers, store managers, in the same way that we do at a regular grocery store. So what he's saying is, though workers have used to deal from exploitation from their bosses and from government, but now the 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 um, the crisis that we're facing is turning to a sense of relevancy. So if if uh, and he makes a point, I think it's the next one. Somewhere down the road, he makes a point that workers. You know, we've workers have had to adapt to different working situations from the agriculture revolution to event, you know, down the road to uh, the industrial revolution to now, you know, to going from farms to factories and now from factories to to grocery stores. But now grocery stores are becoming automated because factories became automated. Now grocery stores and other base or minimal labor jobs are becoming automated. So where are workers going to go next? The the philosophy is. They're going to be irrelevant. And what are humans going to do? How are we going to deal with humans that are quote unquote irrelevant? Like it doesn't take a lot of skill to go from the farm to the factory and then from the factory to the grocery store or to a McDonald's, uh, you know, fry cook. It doesn't take a, you don't need an, you don't need advanced degrees or specific knowledge to go from those kind of, but as those tasks become automated by computers and by AI, what's going to happen to those workers? A lot of people are going to feel a sense of irrelevancy. And this, this is a dilemma. This is the, a dilemma. This is a lesson. This is the technological lesson. Dis- disillusionment. Liberalism depends on growth and globalization to succeed. Growth is also the cause of climate change, exploitation, the wage gap, etc., and eternal growth is not possible. Liberalism needs to reinvent itself to be attractive again to future generations. Yeah, the liberalism established capitalism. It, ex- it established democracy. It gave people a voice. It gave people a sense of meaning. But as that, but that is going to shift if you know if we continue down the path that we're going, where computers take over the world, they can they take over our quote unquote relevancy. Um, and uh, you know, and you know, there's tons. Of, I guess there's debate in the media about capitalism, or it. it ca- I get a lot of TikToks about why capitalism sucks, and uh, I try. I listen to them, and I, I, I like because I, I'm not like a, I'm not quote unquote a capitalist, but we all live in a capitalist world. Globalism is has shifted. The global economy has shifted to a, a capitalist economy, right? So. We're all de- we're all like dealing with the consequences of capitalism and democracy and anyway, yeah. I um, that's well, that's so that's where we're going. If 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 liberalism wants to, is going to succeed again against uh, more competition, it needs to reinvent itself so that these people, these working people who will feel senses of irrelevancy, can well can overcome that and. If, the, if liberalism was going is going to succeed, chapter two work. Maybe this is this is more about more on what we were just talking about. 
And I got tons of notes through this part one. I thought it was fascinating, so I'm going to go through it quickly, try to be brief. AI is becoming better than humans in just about every cognitive ability humans do. Decision-making, advice-giving, marketing, and even driving cars, diagnosing diseases, and making music. Quote, vaunted human intuition is really just patterned recognition. I'm going to, I want to pause there. Actually, I'll, I'm going to finish the note. Automating all driving could reduce car accident fatalities by 90%, he says. Also, and I said, also, aren't planes already automated? I, uh, like, And I think I Googled it, and it's like 90% of the, a plane ride, of a commercial airline, is on autopilot. It's, it's like the pilots aren't doing any, anything. They're just making sure that the, the system doesn't f- crash. Uh, how much human intervention is there in commercial flying? Oh, yeah, I just said that. Quote, on a typical, oh, this is a quote from the website. Fuck, I got to just keep reading. On a typical commercial air flight, autopilot is used for almost 90% of the flight. To simplify, we can consider the flight to be divided into four phases of of flight. Takeoff, cruising, approach, and landing. Okay. That was a quote from a website. Okay, so um, let me go back uh, to his quote. Vaunted human intuition is really just patterned recognition. So his his big argument through the first two books is that humans are just biological mechanisms, biochemical algorithms. We, we, um, and science supports this say, uh, in the sense that we use, or, or, or rather, we ha- our emotions are reactions to our world around us. The things that we're attracted to, that we're not attracted to, the things that are, uh, the things that bring us happiness that bring us sadness or cause suffering or pleasure like eating food is is will make us happy but being hungry causes us suffering right so at at a very 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 basic level humans are we're all we're biochemical algorithms we're designed to respond to certain situations in our environment so liberalism has argued or has promoted that there is this free will right that humans are able to uh, decide the future for themselves, and his argument is, yes. In this, and the, the, he says this again at the very end. This it's just fresh in my brain. We are able to act on our desires and our cravings, but but the on the flip side, we're not able to choose our actions. Or I'm sorry, we're not able to choose our desires. We're not able to choose our cravings. Those things are hardwired into us. Um, and we can, you know, we could talk, well, I'll save my, more of my thoughts on that later on. But the point here is computers are becoming better than humans at processing things, right? At, at uh, as he says, decision-making advice giving and marketing, um, because like taking marketing, for example, all like the, the idea behind marketing is to drive customer, uh, it's to build brand awareness and it's supposed to drive business to you drive yeah p- traffic to your business and this is done like there's science behind the whole thing what people are attracted to uh, uh, like the whole thing behind tiktok and social media is uh creating content that people are attracted to and there are things that people are wired to be attracted to bright lights and interesting sounds and quick moving objects um, are more attractive and more stimulating and more entertaining than you know than like dull colors, slow moving things, quiet things. So marketing is specific. It's designed whether you know whether we're aware of it or not is is taking advantage of our biochemistry to drive business to to drive traffic to your business. So what? So yeah. So in short, computers are are becoming better at humans at creating marketing campaigns and at making effective decisions in businesses or in relationships and giving advice because all because all of those things are just us trying to process our you know, trying to process our emotions and our thoughts to make effective decisions and computers can do that without bias they can do it without error and they can do it consistently uh, What's required is that the computer is coded properly, but that's this is the this is the fundamental issue with computers taking over 
or not even or with humans becoming quote unquote irrelevant is just is computers are becoming better at humans at making decisions. Let's keep going. This modern wave of AI replacing humans through automation may result in both high unemployment and a shortage of skilled laborers. The useless class he des- describes them as. Um, yeah, like I, and then like I said earlier, people in the 80s went from factories to grocery stores, but in 2050, most people can't go from grocery stores to being engineers or coders, right? Those people at the Amazon store. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of skill to to scan grocery items and put them in a bag and customer service. But if that job becomes obsolete, where are those people? And, and fry cooks, there's just no more fry cooks because computers can make hamburgers and chicken nuggets without us needing to, without human intervention. Where are those people going to go? And uh, it's it's easier to go from a fact to go from a low low skill job to a low skill job, and it's not it's almost impossible for p- these people to go f- from every from anybody to go from a low skill job to a high skill job, specialize in engineering or coding or useful skills for the future that we're creating with AI. We're kind of already experiencing this self checkout at grocery stores. Yes, okay, I'm already I'm always ahead of myself. Page thirty seven, second paragraph. What we should do in response to AI taking our jobs. So here's a quote from the boy himself, second paragraph, page 37. So if humans, this is from the book. So if humans needed neither, if humans are needed neither as producers nor as consumers, what will safeguard their physical survival and their psychological well-being? We cannot wait for the crisis to erupt in full force before we start looking for answers. By then, it will be too late. In order to cope with the unprecedented technological and economic disruptions of the 21st century, we need to develop new social and economic models as soon as possible. These models should be guided by the principle of protecting humans rather than jobs. Many jobs are uninspiring drudgery and are not worth saving. Nobody's life's dream is to be a cashier. We should focus instead on providing for people's basic needs and protecting their social status and self-worth. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. What's more important than being a cashier or being the fry cook or being, you know, a janitor, more important than that, than the job, is the person. So he says we need to figure out the solution to the irrelevancy problem today before there's a mass there's mass unemployment and mass irrelevancy we need to figure out how we're going to help people because helping people is more important than helping jobs that's that's it or or people are more important than jobs and that's the bottom line chapter 3 liberty okay page 46 first paragraph uh, on human intuition is fallible do I want to read it? Because I put a quote on there. First paragraph. For better or for worse. Okay, so this is about liberty. For better or for worse, elections and referendums are not w- about what we think. They are about what we feel. And when it comes to feelings, Einstein and Dawkins are no better than anyone else. Democracy assumes that human feelings reflect a mysterious and profound free will. That this free will is the ultimate source of authority and that while some people are more intelligent than others, all humans are equally free. Like Einstein and Dawkins, an illiterate maid also has free will and therefore on election day, her feelings, represented by her vote, count just as much as anybody else's. Um, and then on page 47 he says, feelings are, in based, feelings are based on intuition, inspiration, or freedom. Oh, my God. Did I fuck up the note? Hold on. Let me go back to the page. Um, page 47. Yeah. I fucked. Dude, it's so hard to make notes, like, all the time that are good. So, I think it's freedom. Feelings are not based on intuition, inspiration, or freedom. That's what I think the... Feelings aren't based. Yeah, why would it say are in? Feelings aren't based on intuition, inspiration, or freedom. They are based on calculation. I gotta change that. I gotta fix. I'm sorry, guys. Feelings aren't. 
based on into yeah so feeling okay so the okay the problem here feelings humans have feelings because they're response to our environment and because uh, with the with the enlightenment and um the liberal movement we have pl- we've pr- placed a precedence on our feelings on this quote unquote free will but there is no inherent that like there the there is no magic behind human intuition all our human intuition is is reaction to our environment and what humans want the most really is uh to feel accepted in their tribe and to increase their chances of reproduction and and and, and survival yeah sex and survival are like our base most most poignant human traits we want to survive and we want to spread our genes so that's what we base our decision making on Th- things the policies and politicians that support what we you know what our feelings are promoting to that will give us a higher chance of of reproduction and survival therefore liberalism will lose bargaining power as we discover free will decision making is really just biochemical mechanisms reacting to our environment fun side note uh, I'm going to skip the fun side note. Social media is all about collecting our data and selling it to advisors, right? Over time, as AI is more intimately integrated in our lives and technology, AI could co- concoct the perfect forms of entertainment and remedies for all of us individually. This is more about more on like Homo Deus, the second book that he wrote. AI could just, it can just, if, if we allow, well, let me keep going. Our phones collect certain amounts of our data already. What if we allowed biometrics like brain chips that read our biochemistry that's in sync with the cameras in our homes, on our phones, and on our TVs, and can observe what turns us on, what scares us, and what we want more of? And that data will be sent to Google, Netflix, Spotify, Amazon, and every other data collecting agency. The, the Yeah, if we allow computers to be completely integrated in our lives where they can – like not like not just like – TikTok is so good because it's able to uh, – its algorithm is able to predict what we enjoy just by how long we watch a page, how quickly we swipe through, swipe, uh, swipe away. Um, if we are commenting and liking and checking pages, it will give us similar content. It's really, really good at that. And if we allow all of our computers to be that integrated, even more integrated in our lives, where uh, if we had some kind of chip in our body that and and cameras that could see and ex- see what we're experiencing, understand what we're experiencing, then not only can we get like a finely tuned experience to living, we can get a finely tuned, we can get like finely tuned remedies for our problems. Like when we're feeling sad, it will know exactly what what we like because if someone likes chocolate ice cream but doesn't like vanilla ice cream their body will react differently when they receive either right uh our body will see oh this person likes ice cream and they really like chocolate ice cream so uh because we can see that uh you know i don't know your blood pressure rises because you're excited and ser- there's more, you get more uh, serotonin when you when you get chocolate ice cream than you do vanilla ice cream. But you get even more serotonin when you get uh, chocolate ice cream and a brownie. Like our bodies will just be able to know exactly what we like, exactly what relieves stress and anxiety, and 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 will also know. Be, uh, it will observe how we react to different music and to different movies and to different video games and to different board games will know exactly what we like is this is this wrong is this bad well to be honest we're already kind of living in that world and we're we're doing it through social media social media is like as fun as basic as it comes because the only metric that the phones have is observing how quickly we swipe through videos or how long we stay on a video and what we're liking and what we're commenting on and what pages we follow and it's using all of that data to to get the best content on in our face so it keeps us on the social media as long as possible. We're already living in that kind of world. So you could take it to the next step with the with uh with the body chips and with the brain chips and the cameras and all all of it to that will observe how we what we like and what we don't like to help us live a more 
like exciting life and to and to give us better music and to give us better remedies for sadness and uh help us find better partners get us get us partner you know like link part the the data find a partner that has this similar data that's turned on by the same things that's turned off by the same things right it's it's a it's the philosophy we don't need to get into all the and again i got so much shit i don't need to keep saying it i'm just gonna keep going we already trust algorithms more than our intuition. Yes. So, yeah. So, an argument against, I, I guess I'll say, an argument against allowing all of this is in all of this AI into our lives is because, well, humans know what we know ourselves better than computers do. And uh, we might think that's the case, but um, we can't, we can't tell, we can't observe what all of our biochemical reactions to our environment as they happen in real time. But AI can, and it can usually do it with a really, really good accuracy with very few mistakes. Um, so uh, here's a, okay, so here's a problem for, for all of this. Social media is all about collecting our data and selling it to advertisers, right? Over time, oh wait, didn't I just read this? Oh yeah. Sorry, this is we're going to the next one. We already trust algorithms more than our own intuition. We Google more than we seek truth, as well as Google Maps. Quote, truth is defined by the top result of a Google search. Close quote. If these data closing if these data collecting companies were gathering our biometric data from birth, they could decide our professions, hobbies, life partners, interests, and so forth with accuracy, and we would save time and heartache making wrong decisions well making wrong decisions is part of the human experience well yeah but aren't we always trying to make good decisions we're not always we're not out trying to make bad decisions no one's out there trying to make bad decisions we want to make good decisions we want to live meaningful lives we want to be happy we want to be successful and our if and computers from birth if they were observing all of our biochemical data they could inf they could show us what makes us the happiest, what makes us the saddest, what's it, what we're interested in, what we're not interested, just simply by how our bodies react to the world around us. Quote, unfortunately, that was good for survival and reproduction in the African savanna one million years ago. Our intuition is, I think that's what he's talking about. Oh, um, yeah. So, unfortunately, what was good for our survival and reproduction in the African savanna one million years ago does not necessarily make for responsible, beha responsible behavior on 21st century motorways. We're talking about cars. Humans far more often than not behave according to their emotions in life or death situations rather than their philosophy. Uh, cars... I have, a, I have found a metric on automobile deaths we're going to talk about in a, in a little bit, but... If we allowed all, if we allowed computers to drive all the cars, we would significantly reduce car deaths, automobile deaths, because humans make tons of mistakes, and so many people die every year from unnecessary car accidents. But if we just took people's ability to drive away, we would save so many lives. "Quote: The real problem with robots is not their own artificial intelligence." but rather the natural stupidity and cruelty of the human masters. So in an altruistic world, yes, the, the computers are programmed to serve the people. But just like TikTok, just like Facebook and Instagram that we already use, the creators are intentionally programming these apps to suck as much attention out of us because we're their product. They, we use their product. We use their apps. And they collect our data, our info, what people like, of what age. You know, they, they get our birthdays, they get our sex, they get our race. And then they say, oh, this 26 white male from Utah really likes conversations on philosophy and religion. That's like 90% and, and video games. That's 90% of my TikTok algorithm. And it collects my data. It collects that. And then it sells it to, pe to people trying to sell shit. It sells it to it sells it to to people, you know, like books, it sells it to like workout programs. And then they are advertising. They're targeting me in their advertisements. That's how this works. If you're not paying for a product, you are probably the product. Go watch fucking, um, what's that, that thing that just came out? 
The Social Dilemma. Go watch watch The Social Dilemma. It'll ch- it'll change your whole perspective on social media. We spend millions of dollars improving our technology and very little on improving and understanding human consciousness. Yeah. Because it's because it's usually profit driven and we're we're incentivized to create um yeah, we want to make money. We don't like people at the top. Most people aren't out there trying to make better people and help people live better and more meaningful lives. And the truth is, there's not a lot of money in it. There's not a lot of money in trying to help people live better lives. But there's a lot of money in your data, and there's a lot of money in selling and exploiting people. And unfortunately, but that's just the truth. There's there's a lot more money, like like the um, social media and porn. And Netflix are like the the top, make the most money. They make the most money. Like, how much money does porn bring in a a year? Like, it's astronomical, versus like the self help industry. Let me see, how much money does porn make a year? How big is porn from Forbes dot com? Uh, total two point six to three point nine billion dollars. This is more than a billion dollar gap, but it looks like they're breaking down total revenue from adult videos on the internet, pay per view, and magazines. Yeah, a billion dollars in magazines, a billion on the internet, and 128 million pay per views. So estimates. Oh shit, that was 2001. No, never mind. That's that's way out there. Why did that come up from 2001? So this next, okay, this one's 2012. Jesus Christ, give me something in like. The second decade, okay, this one's Yahoo 2018. Porn could have a bigger economic influence on the U.S. than Netflix. Uh, So, yeah, 2018, this guy, this Yahoo Finance, Ross Bennis, made an article. So, uh, let's see. I just want some figures. Give me some figures. uh, Revenue estimates for the porn industry vary widely. Some believe the industry does not even make $6 billion. While others say it makes ten million, seventeen billion, or even ninety-seven billion, because most porn firms are privately held, it's impossible to get a complete, accurate estimate. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, still a lot of money. Does it say how much Netflix makes? Oh well, here's a okay. Here's a cool uh, graph. So NBA seven point four. Okay, estimated U.S. entertainment industry revenue in two thousand eighteen. Estimated. NBA, $7.4 billion. Hollywood, $11.1 billion. Netflix, 11.7. Viacom, what? Is that like cable TV? 13.3. NFL, 14. And then porn, 15. Middle estimate. Um, yeah, crazy, crazy shit. So that's just what I'm saying. Like, okay, and then I was gonna say, uh, the how much Money does self help make a year? Uh, like self help industry. Um, self improvement market size market data estimates. Okay, this is uh, blog dot market research dot com. Market data estimates that the U.S. self improvement market was worth. Eleven point six billion dollars in two thousand nine. Oh, that's a lot more than I thought. And it contracted by ten per contracted by ten percent to ten point five in twenty twenty. Uh well that's way that's way better than I thought it was gonna be. But okay, but here's you know, the point is um what was my point? <laughs> we spend millions of dollars improving our technology and very little on understanding and improving human consciousness. And per, you know, on a just on a personal level, if you want to ask yourself, how much money do you spend on your Netflix, and how much money do you spend on porn, and how much do you spend on movies and entertainment, and going out to the club, how much do you spend doing that versus how much do you spend on the gy- like your gym membership and books that you read, and like meditation retreats that you go on, how much money are you personally spending on one and the other? Uh, we 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 love to fuck, you know. P- humans love to fuck. That's why porn and NBA and NFL and Netflix and Viacom, whatever the fuck, are gonna are always gonna be uh, really high. So anyway, 
That was chapter three on liberty. Chapter four is equality. Okay, I think that each chapter becomes a little more concise after this, after that one. So chapter four is equality. Last chapter in part one. Essentially, he, he who owns the data rules the world. The data gap will be more significant than the wage gap, power gap, influence gap, race gap, sex gap, or any other equality gap squabble in history. This is our, that's, you know, a lot of this is just speculation and argument and philosophy. So it's not like that, that's, this, none of this is concrete. And what is concrete anyway, you know? But the, you know, the, the message is down the road, like uh, big tech companies are in an arms race to collect as much data as possible. And they, uh, so they're, and what the way they do it is by creating better ways to get content in front of us, right? More attractive forms of content. TikTok was awesome. It has become one. I saw something that says TikTok has become such, was such a success early on right away. Because when you open the app, you don't have to, you don't do anything to find content. It takes you straight to the, you know, you click the app and then you're in the content. And then there's really nothing else on the app. You can explore it. You can, like, search shit. But that's it. There's really just the content that people are posting. That's it. Like, that's all TikTok really is. So that's, uh, you know, like, so, like Facebook has groups and Marketplace and lots of other functions. And Instagram is pictures and not really reels. It has the pictures and is personal profile stuff. Twitter is a bunch of words. But TikTok is, boom, like the highest, the, the, the highest sense of, Oh, uh, what's the word? Like the most um oh shit, there's a way it's like the most engaging kind of entertainment. Uh, there's a different word I'm looking for, but that's that's the same idea. TikTok, the videos and uh, like you get the visual, you get the 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 sounds. Uh, you know, the next success the biggest the next biggest social media is going to be one that incorporates touching and it's going to incorporate taste. Uh, because we're already doing what are the five senses? Smell. That's the other one. The next big social medias are going to incorporate smell, taste, and touch. Where you're watching a video of like a brick mason, but you can like p- place the brick, you know, like, and you can feel it. You can feel the fucking brick and the and the sh- the fucking um, cement that you know is that is it cement that they put between bricks? Shit. So, uh, yeah, tech companies are in an arms race to, to collect as much data as possible, and the, uh, da- the data gap will be more significant than the wage gap, power, influence, race, sex, or any other equality gap squabble in history. Part two, the political challenge. Give me some agua, man. We're chatting. We're 50 minutes in. We're in part one, uh, two out of five. Let's go. Uh, part five, uh, part two, the political challenge, chapter five, community. So part one was the technological challenge. Now we're looking at the political challenge. Chapter five, community. Offline communities enhance online ones. Nothing can replace the quality of offline communities. And, off, and offline communities are things that you do regularly with people in real life. Like you go to church or you go on group hikes or you do a in-person book club, which is would be fun to do if, if there were a group of people reading the books with us. Uh, you doing those things in person will always be more meaningful and significant and have higher quality than any kind of online group. But groups are in- essential for human well-being. We may need to be trained on how to tune into our senses and bodies period. <laughs> we eat in front of the TV, we take pictures of sunsets, and we pay more mind to our smartwatch when we're exercising than our bodies. We are worse at recognizing what's happening in our bodies and consequently relating to other people in real life. So significant. I love that. I, I, I think that is so fascinating because I'm a victim of it too. I love to eat food and watch TV or eat food and like scroll TikTok, like get as much stimulation as possible. I love it because food itself is stimulating. It's designed that way because when we eat, our body needs to be 
needs to know that what this what we're doing is good for us and so our body releases uh, serotonin shit what hormone is released when a person eats released when a person eats Uh, it's taking a while. One of these brain, okay, from health.ucsd.edu from 2011. This is reliable. One of these brain chemicals is dopamine, which is released when people or animals eat tasty foods. So we're already getting a high from dopamine, um, which is the feel good the feel good hormone, right? Um, what is dopamine? Dopamine is a chemical release in the brain that makes you feel good. Having the right amount of dopamine is important both for your body and your brain. Dopamine helps nerve cells uh, to send messages to each other. That's from www.healthdirect.gov.au. So, yes, uh, we, we already get dopamine when we eat food. But as if that's not enough, we feel like we need to enhance our stimulation by watching TV or uh, by watching TikTok, or if you're like George Costanza, you want to eat and have sex, right? You want to get as much stimulation and dopamine as possible because it feels good, man. It feels good. But the problem with doing these things, like he's saying here, is uh, we're we're decreasing our ability to be in the moment and be and and feel our feelings. We're just really just distracting ourselves. I mean, how many of you have been to a concert and you like comp, concerts, music, good music that you like, stimulating, dopamine, feels good. And you sit there with your phone, uh, you know, you're, and you're like watching the phone and making sure the recording is good. And um, and you do that for the whole hour. You're doing like the whole hour. You're just sitting there with your phone up in the air and you're like and, and then, uh, you know, you're missing the moment of being there, watching the musicians and being in your body and paying attention to how the music makes you feel and what the feeling is like being with your friends. You're not even with your friends. If you're sitting there on your phone at a concert, you're not even with your friends or your family. You're on your phone. So we need to remove – these are all the – because we – okay, we do it because we want to remember this moment. We want to remember being at the concert and being front row. and We want to rewatch these and relive this experience, right? So it's not like it's bad in, with bad intentions that we do these things. Uh, when when I eat in front of the TV, it's not because I'm I'm trying to distract myself from my body. It's because usually, it's it's I eat dinner and watch TV, and it's because I want to like relax and re- unwind for the day. And there's a new episode of something I want to watch, and this is a great time to do. I'm killing two birds with one stone, right? It's not like I have bad intentions, but there are consequences to these decisions. There's consequences to recording um, the concert that you're at instead of just watching it. There's consequences to like sitting on an airplane with your headphones on for the whole flight instead of taking them off and being in the moment and being with the people in the room. Like going to breakfast and uh, putting your phone, leaving your phone in the car will do way more for you, for your well-being and for your relationships, that even than just having the phone on the countertop. I can't remember the, the studies that are I've heard where just having the phone, like even if your phone isn't, you're not on it, even if the screen is off and it's set on the table, uh, it having that in sight decreases the quality of the connection you make with people when you're having conversations. So just having the phone out of sight and at, like completely removed from the equation does more for connection than uh, than it does even um, having it like off but on the table. You know what I mean? So uh, community. <sighs> The political challenge community. We need in-group relationships in real life communities, and uh, we need to be better at, at at we need to be better at being present for these experiences for these people. Chapter six: Civilization. For the most part, the globe shares the same politics, medicine, religion, and currency. For the most part. Those nations that oppose them for their own usually lag behind in innovation and liberal achievements, like everyone getting health care, education, opportunity, etc. Globalization comes with its own set of headaches, but has overwhelmingly led to technological and liberty advancements 
and I should say the innovation. So uh, this is, yes, civilization. Global is, uh, technology and globalization combined have led to a lot of innovation. And Homi, as a historian, he, he elaborates on a bunch of different cultures and societies and governments that have existed and failed and caused good things and caused hard, bad, you know, harmful things over time. He goes through tons of examples. He's way smarter than me. And you know what we do here. We're, we're cherry picking the data and the information and the research. Um, so, uh, but the, the overwhelming evidence is that globalization and the adopting of similar politics, medicine, religion, and currency, not the, not the same, not like we're all doing the exact same thing in all across the world, but we all, we like politics, mo- a lo- most first world countries are democratic, are, are democratic. Um, medicine is, st- is there's, a, there's standard medicine practice all over the world. Not, it's not just witchcraft and people thinking that certain herbs and postures will fix an ailment. No, if you, if you get, um, you know, if you get a fucking bacterial infection, there's antibiotics and that's science. And, and the whole world recognizes, or most of the world recognizes science and medicine. Um, yeah. And currency, like we, most world most currencies are recognized they don't have the exact same value but you can take the US dollar to an, a different country and get it exchanged for the local currency at whatever the the exchange rate is so this is what i'm like back in the day you, you if you had you know if you took your shilling because you're european and you went to some other part of the world and their currency was <laughs> were seashells you know they're they're not gonna be they're gonna be like your money. What the fuck is your money? Your money is no good. Here. We've we've um, civilization has the world is globalized. That's the point of this chapter. I'm gonna move on. Chapter seven, nationalism. We owe much of our freedom to nationalism. It convinced people to work and die for each other for a better nation. One problem with nationalism is it creates an us versus them mentality. That now we have. That now that we have nuclear bombs and climate issues could result in the end of mankind. And the, the, a shining example of nationalism and the problems with nationalism is the attack on Pearl Harbor and uh, from the Japanese nation. Um, Japan, he, he talks about this at length, how the Japanese have incorporated loyalty to japan and to its culture and it, 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 like the government instilled this in the civilians which a lot you know people aren't going to go on kamikaze missions for a cause that they don't believe in or for a religion that they don't believe in for a god that they don't believe in right if if you told me to get in a plane on a, on a one-way trip because because the god that has christened america will bless you and Put you in hell. I'll call bullshit on that. But Japan, uh, the Japan in World War II convinced its civilians that this essentially that's what will happen. And uh, not to ridicule, not to ridicule that, but that because nationalism at the same time create creates a sort of bond between the civilians that allow for, um, like. It allowed for the colonies in the early, in early America to come together to uh, to fight against the the Great Britain oppression. That the you know it unites people national with the, with the, gives people a similar cause and and helps them achieve a general goal. And uh, so nationalism isn't bad, but a couple things we need to consider is that nationalism the nation that you will live and die for isn't real it only exists in our imagination and just like jobs that we talked about earlier more important than the jobs are the people and more important than the nation are the people we need to uh, not be because the people are more important than the nation because the people are the ones that experience 
we are the only ones that experience the pain and suffering and also the pleasure and the joy of the nation, of this imaginary entity. So if we do something for the nation, that's not, Im- that's not immoral. But if we cause suffering to other people in the name of the nation, we're at- that's immoral. We're acting immorally, I believe. Uh, and now that we have nuclear bombs and climate issues, this us against them mentality could be the end of uh, men of mankind. Yes, I mean, it, so when it was back then, when it was bows and arrows and musket fire against each other, you know, nations had to fight against each other with with sticks and stones. Now we have nuclear bombs, and we make threats about about the way the world should be, and uh, conflict can escalate to some pretty horrendous. I don't need to explain this. I'm sure most of you are aware that of the conflict with Russia and Ukraine and the nuclear threats that are being made and North Korea being fucking crazy. But, uh, you know, at the, at the same time, we are, uh, well, you know, not at this, you know, we're at a point in our, our own human history where problems could escalate to something far cataclysms far greater than we c- than could ever have been imagined because of uh, of bombs and climate change too if we don't unite as a one human race to make decisions to solve climate change we're just going to make things worse now that we have a global ecology economy and science oh now comma we have a global ecology economy and science but still are stuck with national politics global government is not realistic he says the idea is national governments should consider global problems with greater importance. Nuclear threats, climate change, AI in- integration, to name a few. Uh, yeah, so so anyway, that's the same point. Let's move on. That was nationalism. Chapter 8 is religion. Can religions help solve the problems of today's world? Question mark. <laughs> he outlines three types of problems. With religion, page 131. Technical problems, policy problems, and identity problems. In the past, religions have uh, mostly answered these technical policy and identity problems. Let's see, I'm going to go to 131. Yes, okay. Um, So how relevant are religions such as Christianity, Islam, and Hinduism? Can they help us solve the major problems we face? To understand the role of traditional religions in the world of the 21st century, we need to to distinguish between three types of problems. Technical problems. For example, how should farmers in arid countries deal with severe droughts caused by global warming? Two, policy problems. For example, what measures should governments adopt to prevent global warming in the first place? And uh, three, identity problems. For example... Should I even care about the problems of farmers on the other side of the world, or should I only care about problems of people from my own tribe and country? All right. So these are the questions. Like these are the questions to consider with current modern day re- re- religions. So the couple notes I had here: quote, the victory of science has been so complete that we no longer associate religion with farming and medicine. Uh, exactly. You know, like obvious examples are people doing people praying for rain for their crops and people uh, people giving blessings over people that are sick. We used to uh, because we didn't know uh, we didn't know where sickness came from, why people got sick or we didn't understand anything about pathogens or bacteria or viruses. Uh, We didn't uh, we didn't understand much about our climate with the with when rain when rain came comes and goes and droughts like we didn't understand much of this and so we came up with religion we came up with a god that is or gods that dictate rain that dictate sickness and they punish people and they and they reward people and uh doing and and these things or having god as the source of the problems and the benefits and the rewards meant that we, humans it was only responsible to do a rain dance if we're if <laughs> if 
we plant a crop and we need rain for the crop. It only made sense that if there's a God, if God is the one that's dictating this, then we should pray to him and we should pay our tithing and we shouldn't be adulterous. Uh, and then if, you know, if a plague comes us because it's God's wrath, because we didn't do this thing back in the day or because God is punishing us for something else, or because we were adulterous, you know, because our king was was um, immoral or unjust, made a like executed that guy that shouldn't have been executed. Right. So, yeah, that's stupid. But the victory of sci- science helps us understand the weather. It helps us understand medicine and and sickness illnesses pathogens the victory of science has been so complete that we no longer associate religion with farming and medicine not even a little bit we don't say well this you know this person got got the flu because of a virus but also because he did this thing and god is punishing him like science (laughs) science is conclusive in that regard not about everything but when it comes to like people get sick because of pathogens and because of viruses and bacteria, right? And our and we understand the immune system and red cells and white and white blood cells. Uh anyway, so that's you know, that's that. Religion combined with national indoctrination is part of what fueled Japanese kamikaze and still fuels a lot of today's behavior. You see how every how like n- like I'm just thinking ahead. When I use the Japanese kamikaze example, I'm just thinking ahead. I have no idea that I'm already going to talk about it. Religion combined with nationalist indoctrination is part of what fueled Japanese kamikaze and still fuels a lot of today's behavior. Like, ding, 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 the January 6th with Trump and fuck. It does more harm than good regarding solving global problems. Uh, Yeah. Religion and government indoctrination does more does more harm than good regarding regarding solving global problems. Not about like establish not about establishing yourself as a country or freeing yourself from oppression somehow, like the the early American colonists fighting against the oppression against the Brits. But religion and nationalist indoctrination does not help against current global issues. Chapter 9, Immigration. There's a great and legitimate debate on how immigration should be done. A notable claim he makes is, we live in a globalized market. Phones and clothes come from China, oil from the Middle East, and food from South America. We may not share cultural norms. Oh, wow, something in my eye, sorry. Oh, ow. Oh, shit. We may not share cultural norms, but we should have each other's best interests at heart. So there's a, there, there's great debate on the immigration issue, and he doesn't make a stance. He, he goes over the pro-immigration argument and the anti-immigration argument, and he, and he makes great points on both sides. And this is what good discussion looks like, I think, where you can examine all sides of a, of a debate of an issue – Look at the pros of one side and the cons. Look at the pros and cons of the other side. And and really, we want to make the best decision possible. And he's not making a decision. He was just he just he he made a whole bunch of points. Uh, but the you know what was what was most notable to me, or what stood out the most to me, was we live in a globalized market. Phones and clothes come from Asia, oil from the Middle East, and food from South America. You know, at the very least, we sh- we may not all sh- share cultural norms, but we should. Have each other's best interests at heart. Um, so you know, there people may have concerns about legitimate concerns about um, people emigrating or immigrating to their country, and uh, but it's we should be compassionate to people because again, what's more important is not the jobs or the place that you live, the the, the nation. The nation is not what's important. It's the people. It's always about the people. The people are always more important than the job or than the nation or than the government or the religion or whatever, whatever that we, whatever we value, whatever, or whatever we think we value. The people are always more important, always. So, uh, you know, consider that for what it's worth. The people are always more important. Um, the people like, like the, the 
revolts that are going on in or the protests in China over the COVID mandates because they they still have COVID restrictions or the trucker protests in Canada or the Black Lives Matter protests. You know, the it's like we should be supporting the people. It should always be about the people and we should hear them out. And like he tried to do with this chapter, we should look at all sides of the argument, but then we got to be understanding and realistic and make good decisions for the betterment of the people, not for the betterment of the nation, not for the betterment of jobs, not for the betterment of politics or your political position, the betterment of the people. That's always what's most important. That's chapter nine with immigration. Part three, despair and hope. You know what I'm thinking? You know what I'm thinking right now? We're an hour and 15 minutes in. I'm anticipating maybe another hour of this bullshit. So I'm thinking I'm going to just record it all on the stream. It'll be a long episode, but I think I'm going to post it in two parts. Because I still got three more parts of this fucking book, which is awesome because it was such a good book. But I don't want to just condense all of this awesome content. I don't know. I know I say 60 to 90 minutes, not 60 to 90 minute episodes, but fuck it. Fuck it. We'll do it live. Let me get some water. That's going to be the hard part doing the whole, this whole book is (laughs) I'm going to be talking for a long time and my throat gets tired. (sighs) Chapter 10, part three. Despair and Hope, Chapter 10, Terrorism. All right, so we talked about the technological issue. We talked about the political issue. Now we're talking about despair and hope. Terrorism, it's interesting that he makes a, like he dedicates an entire chapter to terrorism, but it all, it all ties in together, each chapter. So we'll start with terrorism. He has repeatedly illustrated how many more people die from traffic accidents, diabetes, heart disease, air pollution, etc., than other things that produce more fear and get more attention, like terrorism, war, plane crashes, natural disasters, etc. I think that's, and this is where I'm going to talk about this, the thing that I found on the internet of people dying, how many more people die. Because what, you know, we don't talk about how many people die from car accidents. Well, people die. People do, but they don't cause as much fear or as much outrage in the media than things like terrorism or natural disasters uh, or like, you know, drug overdoses. Um, Those things are horrible, horrible things. Absolutely. And we should mitigate them as much as possible. But we don't talk about big issues like the the number one killer in the world is cardiovascular disease. And this is from the uh, ourworldindata.org website. Uh, what, in 2019, 18.6, almost 18.6 million people died from cardiovascular disease, from heart disease, man. 18.6, um, 10.08 from cancers, almost 4 million from respiratory diseases, almost uh, let's, 2.5 million from digestive diseases. Two and a half from lower respiratory infections, neonatal disease. Like, these are all at the top of the list. And you know what's, um, I, don't know, I don't know, like eight down the list? Road injuries. 1.2 million people died in 2019 in the world from road injuries. 1.2 million people. And you know how many people died from natural disasters in 2019? 6,076, and I don't know what percentage that is, but one point, what was it, 1.2 million from road injuries, and only 6,076 from, you know, not only, six. that's a lot of people that, that, that died and that we should actively work to prevent, but here's the point that he makes, and that I think is, like, a no-brainer. If we can reduce traffic accidents and traffic deaths by a significant margin by integrating computers to drive our cars for us, because it's not like it would be one thing if some humans drove and some computers drove because uh, computers can't talk to humans like, 
you know, and humans aren't talking to other humans. Like human drivers aren't talking to all the other human drivers at the same time. But if all the computers drove at the same time, they could all be driving together. They could all be integrated to drive together to significantly reduce, not like completely obliterate um, traffic fatalities because there will still there will always be accidents, especially with the, the millions of cars that are driving every day. But we can significantly reduce it uh, by by reducing the human factor, by the human decision making factor. Uh, there was another. Well, so I just think that statistic is crazy. A little over six thousand people died from natural disasters, but um, cars killed one point two million people in two thousand nineteen, and cardiovascular disease and cancer killed like almost 30 million people but they don't get like we're not always the news isn't always talking about ways to reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease or cancers because it doesn't sell headlines it doesn't sell paper and it doesn't it doesn't bring it's not a like it's, it's not attractive to the business there's not a good business model in it but that's those are the like if those are killing the most people don't you think that we should be active and there are people that are working on reducing cardiovascular disease deaths and cancer deaths? No doubt. But we should like the amount of money that we spend on like or the amount of attention that we give things like plane crash. Like how many people f- are afraid of flying because they're afraid the plane is going to crash? Yeah, it's like that. That shit is terrifying to think about. I think about it and get terrified. But how many people die from plane crashes a year? Shit, I'm going to Google it. Oh, give me that keyboard. Um, how many people died from plane crashes worldwide? Two thousand nineteen. Two hundred eighty-nine. These figures include the number of fata- fatal airliner whole loss accidents and fatalities. The figures exclude corporate jet and military transportation accidents. Okay. Uh, but still, like less than a thousand. Uh, in 2017, 59 people. This is from statista. dot com. S t a t i s t a. dot com. All right, that's that's the point. So I'm gonna keep going. Um, where's my notes? Okay, so yeah. So we so we freak out more about terrorism. Than we do like other things that kill way more people, but there's good reason for it. Ter- uh, regarding terrorism, terrorist's largest tool is fear, holding our imaginations captive, and causing fear in a large group or powerful politicians can cause the group or government to do more damage than the terrorists could ever do on their own. With regard to terrorism, we are our own worst enemy. Part of this is because terrorism undermines a government's legitimacy where traffic accidents and sexual assaults do not. So they don't get as much attention or prevention from governments for those reasons. It, uh, traffic accidents don't threaten a government's legitimacy, but terrorism certainly does. So when when there's, you know, like the the World Trade Centers and were there like 4,000 people that died from uh, that accident, from the 9-11 um, accident or not accident but terrorist attack uh 4000 people is you know like statistically just talking about figures is much less significant than car accident fatalities or right i made that point already but the threat that terrorism poses to a government's legitimacy causes so much fear in the civilians uh if you know if people if people actually thought that ISIS or al qaeda or other active terrorist groups were going to take over our government, it would cause so much fear in the people. But traffic, traffic accidents don't cause fear in the, in the people's confidence in the government, right? So that's why governments and people freak the fuck out when, when a scary... Like the, um, there, were, there was a sh- shooting in Paris a few years ago or several years ago, and I think less than 100 people died and... That and again, all of these accidents should always be prevented if possible. They should always, and that's why, that's why we love TSA now. To that will prevent terrorist attacks from with 
taking planes and shit, right? But uh, um, again, not all accidents are preventable. AI wouldn't solve the traffic fatality number, but it would dramatically reduce it. Just like TSA has dramatically reduced terrorists taking over commercial airlines, right? So um, terrorism and their biggest fool is their biggest tool is fear, the fear that they impose on humans, on us. Uh, let's see. Oh, I got a text from work. I'm going to take that later. Preventing nuclear terror. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I'm going to jump right back into it. Preventing nuclear terrorism is a priority, but should not come before other existential problems like deterioration of the ozone and fertile soil. Yeah, we are as a globe because of because of uh, political and corporation uh, manipulation and un- injustices and exploitation. Are we have climate? We have problems with climate change. We have problems with uh, soil, with farming. We have problems with food, and we have problems with homes and homeless people and and other forms of security. Uh, Nuclear war, nuclear threats, like there's lots of global problems to always be considering and cautious of. And uh, t- uh, the threat of terrorism is a priority. Preventing nuclear terrorism, like terrorists getting nuclear bombs, that is a priority. But but these things, but there are other existential problems like the deterioration of the ozone and fertile soil that we should be prioritizing as well. That, w- that should come before these things, right? Like we're not going to have a world in... 50 years they say if we continue down the path that we are going down chapter 11 war the spoils of war gave way to valuable resources like slaves land and water one of the most valuable resources today include technological and institutional knowledge which cannot be taken by force like people or land This is one reason why war has shifted from physical battles to cyber and psychological battles. This makes me think about, uh, I don't know how many people are, I'm sure everyone's aware that TikTok in the United States pumps a ton of just garbage in our face. Because who gives a fuck? Just like consume and watch what you want to watch and like what you like and who cares? Who gives a fuck, right? But then in China... The communist dictatorship, they have restrictions on TikTok. You only get like an hour a day, I think. And they only show you uh, creative things like science experiments and and um, governmental propaganda like in a positive way to like to inspire a new generation of intelligence and curiosity and allegiance to the communist chinese regime and and, you know i disagree with that way of indoctrinating kids but the the outcome will be dramatically different from the united states if we continue down the same path where kids today in the united states are just constantly consuming a bunch of nonsense What what are our kids going to look like if they if all they consume is a bunch of nonsense from tiktok Playing video games, uh, TV, porn, food, eating whatever they want, like without without discipline. It's not that the solution isn't to enforce a communist regime on American citizens. The answer is to is to like to help educate kids and parents and edu- and and. Yeah, you can enforce rules. Like I remember, I remember having a friend when I was a kid that only got an hour of video game time a day, and I thought that it was so lame, and I, I thought his parents were so lame. But uh, you know, as an adult now, and thinking about having kids and how I would want to, I want to do the same thing for my kids. I want to give them like limited screen time and more exposure to things in the like to creativity and innovation, and and to like explore the world. And to do something positive and to find meaning in the world, right? But but technology is so enticing. It's so exciting. It's way more exciting than science experiments. Unless you're a fucking nerd, right? <laughs> so, 
War has changed. Wow, I'm talking about war, man. This chapter's on war. War has changed from like conquering land and taking slaves and taking people as slaves to stealing data, hacking technology. And uh, so there's less boots on the ground war. There's still that. We have it right now in Russia and Ukraine, but it's a lot less common because the most one of the most valuable resources today, war in the past was about conquering resources, which were land and resources and people. And now it's still those things, but mostly it's data. And we can we can steal like people can go to war on data and on the people cybernetically. Is that how you'd say it? And psychologically by hacking the internet, people, you know, your rival country's internet and stealing their data and information and whatever. Whoops. Important for global superpowers to re- recognize another world war is not impossible. Many problems have originated from human stupidity. Yes. Just because it's unlikely that there will be another world war or nuclear war doesn't mean there won't be. And we should be aware that people most like most shitty experiences that human ex- that humans endure come from human stupidity. Right. We got to be aware of. That we got to be aware that although it's unlikely or although it doesn't make any sense to have a nuclear war, humans have done stupid stuff in the past that will continue to do stupid stuff. People in power, people with influence will do stupid shit, make stupid decisions that cause a lot of grief for a lot of people. We can't rule it out. Chapter 12, humility, moving from war and terrorism to humility, quote, Many religions praise the value of humility, but then imagine themselves to be the most important thing in the universe. They mix calls for personal meekness with blatant collective arrogance. Humans of all creeds would do well to take humility more seriously. That's it. That's, that, that's a great note. That's a great note to end that chapter on. 13. God. We think of God as the most vague philosophical unknown energy of the universe, or the specific person or persons who has revealed their every wish and whim. There's the philosophical God where we, we, you know, we ponder like, uh, who is he? How did he create the universe? Or there's this, you know, like the religious God that we know every, every single thing that he wants from his subjects, from his, from the people. We don't need to invoke a God to live morally. Good morals exist outside of religion or a belief in God. That's secular secularism. Secularism? Nope. Secularism. We don't need God to we don't need to invoke God to ha- live morally. Good morals exist outside of religion or belief. Although God and morals help people be more moral and live meaningful lives, they also are the fuel for hatred and bigotry. Secularism isn't the answer to hatred or bigotry. The people, who, secular people, also uh, are can be hateful and bigoted. The point is, being religious doesn't, being religious or believing in a god doesn't automatically make you better morally or ethically compared to non-believers or secular people. It all boils down to the fruits. Then, huh? That's what I said. Yeah, just because you're a religious person doesn't make you better. Doesn't make you better. And, uh, yeah, that's it. I'm going to, let's keep going. Chapter 14, secularism. The secular ethical code consists of truth, compassion, equality, freedom, courage, and responsibility. It forms the foundation of modern scientific and democratic institutions. Uh, okay. So we talked about God and religion ish. Mostly about God. Now we're talking about secularism. So we say that good ethics and morals exist outside of God and and religion, and they absolutely do. Uh, The so he describes the secular and the secular ethical code being truth, compassion, equality, freedom, courage, and responsibility. It's the foundation of modern scientific and democratic institutions. Yes. And what's the four virtu- what's the four cardinal virtues the the uh, platonic virtues 
Does anyone remember? Wisdom, courage, justice, temperance. And we get uh, courage and justice in there. Oh, no, justice isn't in there. Truth could be wisdom. Equality could be justice, courage, and temperance isn't in there. Uh, yeah. Nope. That's fine, though. Close enough. The secular ideal revo- relies on observation, evidence, and feelings rather than just faith yeah you take a religious ideal and you you know you like religion and you say yeah you can you can go to like god wants us to be he wants us to tell the truth be compassionate be equal uh, have equality freedom courage responsibility he god wants us to have these things but the only way that you know the only way that um you can make it back to god is if you do these things and you pray to him and pay your tithing and get baptized and whatever, or whatever your religion denotes denotes. Yeah. I think that's the right. Uh, I'm going to Google denotes real quick. Whatever your religion suggests. Yeah. Be a sign of or indicates. Yes. Um, but, uh, secularism advocates for observation, evidence, and feelings rather than just faith. Uh, so it requires, like, uh, that's all I got to say. I'm going to keep going because I got a few notes because you know that I'm interested in religion. Religion promotes obedience, secularism. Oh, whoops. Religion promotes obedience. Secularism promotes compassion. It blurs the lines of accountability and duty. You obey commandments like killing, excuse me, not killing, stealing and cheating not because you value the well-being of others, but because you fear the wrath of God. Yeah, okay, so this is this is what I mean when I'm like, I don't think it's wrong to believe in God. I'm not going to tell someone not to believe in God, especially if it gives you meaning or gives you purpose in life and makes you be a better person and, and live a, you know, like raise your kids to do the same and be the same. Um, the, uh, I find it, the, 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 best way that i've said or that i could think of saying it right now is i find it more responsible to acknowledge that the meaning and and the values that you find in religion are uh have us have like a have a realistic source it's not just that god uh you know like that god created everything and then expects us to be compassionate and so we should be compassionate or that we should be truthful it's that if we're when we're truthful or when we're compassionate, we build social cohesion. And because of thousands of years of evolution, we our biology has de- has evolved to favor compassion and truth telling because it it built it is it established and strengthened social bonds and increases the chance of survival. And that's why humans are so social. And that's just the that's just the nature of it, man. So it's not just be, it's not because God said so. It's there's like scientific explanation. So I I find it more responsible to acknowledge this the the or the natural origin of things rather than just saying everything that you do is because of God. And like I like I'm saying here, you obey commandments like not killing, stealing, and cheating, not because you value the well-being of others but because you fear the wrath of God. It's like it's like a sub... Oh, well, the word I want to say is subprimal, like stupid liver king, but that's not the right, you know. It's, it's not as... Uh, it's not as virtuous as... Like not killing because you're afraid of going to jail, jail or, or the consequences of God is less valuable than not killing because you value other people or that you, that you care about other people. Right. Quote, questions you cannot answer are usually far better than far better for you than answers you cannot question. Uh, Close quote. I thought that was interesting. Quote, the secular world judges people on the basis of their behavior rather than their favorite clothes and ceremonies. Or in other words, for their religion, the secular world judges people on their behavior and religions judge people based on. How they pray, where they pray, who they worship, how they worship, this and that. Dumb, right? It, it comes down to your fruits then, huh? It comes down, like, are you actually a good person? And then, yeah, and then believe whatever you want. 
But are you actually a good person? Because that's what actually matters. Not if you believe in a certain God or a certain way of life. That's not what matters. It's the message. It's the message you, that you teach and live by. More important than anything, what's most important, I said that twice, what's more important than anything is acknowledging your own flaws and shortcomings and taking steps to improve in those areas. If your organization claims infallibility, it loses credibility. I coined that. I'm coining that. If your institution claims infallibility, it loses credibility. Yeah, most important is acknowledging, being able to acknowledge flaws and shortcomings and take steps to improve. But if your organization claims, yeah, we're perfect and we've got it all figured out, we have all the answers and this is the truth and there's nothing else that's true or nothing else is the full truth, if, if everything else is just partially true but has some, but we, we have the full truth or the full understanding of anything, you lose credibility. If you claim infallibility, you lose credibility. I'm coining that. I'm coining the shit out of that. <sighs> Part four. Truth. God damn, this is a crazy episode, man. Uh, 15. Ignorance. The only way to really gain the truth of a thing is to spend a lot of time with the fiction. Uh, this cha- This chapter had a ton of ton of awesome thoughts on like group think and social behavior like how we we believe things because someone that we respect believes in something but we don't actually like and then it goes back to the google searching and we just trust what google says or we just trust what people on tiktok say because we like what they say because it fits our biases because we feel like it increases our chances of reproduction and survival right so um the truth is if you want to gain the actual truth of anything, the, uh, you have to spend time with the fallibility, with the fiction, with the false. You have to spend time understanding why something isn't the truth. You have to understand the false and the fiction of a thing to understand the truth or the reality of a thing. Uh, and we spent, and too many humans live in ignorance and they live in the fiction and they claim it as the truth. And it's, and it's actually hard to tell the difference. It really is. It really is hard to live in a world of reality and truth. It's really, really hard, especially when I feel like we live in a world that's so subjective now where our, our gender and our, and our feelings and our identity are so subjective and so fluid. It's so hard to establish a rea- to establish quote unquote reality. But that's the world we live in, and it's going—it's only going to increase in fluidity because of uh, because of, well, really because of like we have we're not so concerned with our survival. We can explore these crazy, not crazy. We can explore different kinds of identity. So uh, ignorance is ignorance is just is just I guess it's just like choosing to go with what with your gut, what feels good and what makes sense without contemplating reality, without contemplating the truth. And the only way to know the truth is to consider all aspects of a thing and then to, to diagnose, not diagnose, but to decide what's fiction and what's truth. And then, that, and then, you know, that's it. And then that's the truth. It's not fun. You know, it's not a, it's not like a sexy way to live. It's not, it's analytical and it's kind of boring and it's not attractive. And people make a lot of money on deceiving and deception, and like liver. Like I, I've already brought up Liver King, but he's like the talk of the town right now on deception, claiming, uh, <laughs> claiming that he was all, all natural. When I, I don't know if if any of you don't know Liver King, he's a social influencer who promotes eating liver raw liver and doing two workouts blood girdling workouts a day and to, and then you can look like him and he's just a super jacked dude and he promotes these um he promotes liver pills and organ pills and anyway he's selling a product he's trying to sell a product and a lifestyle and he said that he's natural he's never taken steroids or performance enhancing drugs but he recently was found out that he has been and then he came clean and said that it happened and he was a lie it was all deceptive 
But a lot of people bought the message, and a lot of people still defend him. And when I, you know, I still follow him, and I read the comments, and a lot of people still defend him and his decision to lie to help people. Right? Is that moral or is it immoral to lie to help people? I'm just gonna I'm gonna pose the question. So, uh, but if you want to live in a, in reality and you want to live in the truth and you want to know the truth, you have to spend a lot of time understanding and exploring fiction. That's chapter 15. Chapter 16, justice. Four methods we immodestly judge moral dilemmas on a global scale because of our primitive brains. I'm going to re- read that again because it's a, there's a, you know, I made a lot of points. There are four methods we as humans immodestly judge moral dilemmas on a global scale because of our primitive brains. And a, a, an example of a moral dilemma right now is like Russia invading the U- the Ukraine claim and trying to claim sovereignty or or Ukraine trying to 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 maintain their sovereignty that's a moral dilemma so here's four ways that we immodestly judge these immoral di- or these moral dilemmas one we downsize the issue and we do these things because of our primitive brains because we got monkey brains and we do this to try to make sense of the world around us we downsize the issue. We reduce conflict between nations to one good guy and one bad guy. When in reality, again, in truth, there's a whole complex arrangement of issue or of problems, and compl- everything is complex. Nothing is straightforward. the The conflict between Russia and Ukraine isn't Russia good, or I'm sorry, Russia bad, Ukraine good, or really the other way around. It's not Russia good, Ukraine bad. It's there's it's far more complex, but we reduce it. We downsize the is- the issue just to make sense of it so that we can judge the situation morally or immorally. Two, we focus on touching on a touching story that ostensibly stands for the whole conflict. People are more likely to donate to charities when the charity focuses on one starving child and puts up pictures of this one person and says that your dollars are helping support people like this one person, this one child than statistically sharing or than sharing statistics of famine in Africa, right? So, yeah, so he, he shared a study where people were w- more willing to donate to a charity when the charity said every dollar helps kids like this and they showed a picture of this one kid instead of sharing the statistics to famine in, in a region, in Africa, or, you know, in an area. We don't care about the numbers. We don't care about the, the – like we could talk about gl- climate change, like the, the ozone is depleting and we're losing – like our atmosphere is losing its integrity. But we don't care until uh, like until a city has been – you know, has been destroyed because of climate change. And then you can focus on, well, we – you know, donate to our charity because we support fighting climate change or, or working against climate change because look at what happened to L.A., or look at what happened to this family in L.A. And you don't, we don't want this to happen to you or to anyone else. So every dollar that you donate goes to supporting or helping families like this that have been tragically stricken to by climate change, right? So, okay, that's the second point. The third, we weave in conspiracy theories. It is easier to conceive 20 multi-billionaires pulling the strings behind the media and, and government decisions than it is to examine all facets of a global economy. And it is probably impossible for anyone or any team to comprehensively understand the entire uh, global economy. But it's way easier for humans to create a, a conspiracy theory or theories about how Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos and Donald Trump and Hunter Biden are doing these things and Hillary Clinton are doing these things behind closed doors and pulling all these strings and making the world go the way that they want it to go. It's way easier to and not to say that they're not making you know big impacts or influences on people or the economy, but they're not it it just makes more sense in our it's easier in our brains to think, oh well, these people are Jeff Bezos, he just and Elon Musk, they just bend the world behind closed doors and influence and they make everything go the way they want it to go when there are so 
many facets and so many inputs in a global economy, it's impossible to comprehend. It's imp- and not to say that these powerful, rich people um, don't have any influence. They certainly have influence on our economy. But they, you know, it's unrealistic and it's irresponsible to conclude that these people are pulling all the strings and have all the influence over the economy. And then the fourth point for justice on uh, immodestly judging moral dilemmas, quote, we create a dogma, put our trust in some allegedly all-knowing theory, institution, or chief, and follow it wherever it leads. Oh, burping, sorry. We create a dogma, put our trust in some allegedly all-knowing theory, institution, or chief, and follow it wherever it leads. So those are the four. Those are four ways that we down or that we um, immodestly judge moral dilemmas on a global scale because of our monkey brains. It's difficult to establish global justice when people and nations are primarily concerned with advancing their own interests rather than global truth and ideals. Yes, and it always will be harder to establish global justice when we only care about ourselves. Um, or when we only care about our nations, even. Uh, if we only care about Amer- like like England, Le- the gr- uh, Great Britain, and Brexit, right? And like they were saying with Trump trying to build a wall at the Mexican border. Uh, be it as it may, they uh, uh, a huge argument why these people and countries do this is because they're trying to say globalization... Or the global problems, they're not our pro- they're not America's problems, they're not Britain's problems. Let the world figure them out. They're not ours. But in a global in a it, when everything is globalized, we all share responsibility. Uh, we can't have international an international economy without international politics and international problem solving. If we want to, you know, if we if we're gonna live in a global society, we need to have uh, global solutions. Um, there's another, there's a point, I don't know where he talks about it, but there's a point he makes. Um, like the answer isn't like to have a, we, we don't want to create a global government. That's not the answer. We could still have our national governments but we need to keep the global interests in mind. And the global interests, again, if, if the people are what really matter, then we need to keep the people in all nations at the, pro- at the top of the pyramid. Not the politicians, not, not individual nations, not money, not innovations. It's the people. It's always the people. That's what should be at the pinnacle of our global problem solving is how can we increase the quality of lives across all nations, across all nations in our globalized uh, economy, ecology, whatever. Chapter 17, post-truth. Now we're almost two hours in. We got a few more chapters. Uh, We're doing it, baby. Myths bring people together better than any truth ever has. (laughs) Ha ha. Nice. That's religion for you. And governments. Myths bring people together better than any truth ever has. Myth also contributed to a distortion version of reality. For example, Coca-Cola advertisements associate the drink with youth and health and sports. But Coke, in reality, gives people diabetes and makes you unhealthy. uh, So myths distort our reality. Religions distort the the meaning of the universe and the meaning of our lives. And Coca-Cola distorts... (laughs) <laughs> like what a good time is and what health looks like. And, you know, you, know, you might think that this sounds dim-witted, but he shared a, he shared a study where, there, where a significant amount of people associate Coca-Cola with health and youth and sports rather than with diabetes and unhealth. Unhealth? Well, like not being healthy. It's myths, and that's what myth they myths bring us together, and they ch- distort our distort reality. "Quote: People began to sanctify. I'm sorry. People begin to sanctify the Bible and the Vedas or the Book of Mormon only long after repeated exposure to other people who view it as a secret. Or I think he meant to say sacred. God, I suck at taking notes." 
people begin to sanctify the Bible, the Vedas, the Book of Mormon only after long and repeated exposure to other people who view it as sacred. We learn to respect holy books in exactly the same way we learn to respect paper currency. Yeah, we we respect it because we say that it's valuable. So, chapter 12, this or chapter 17, this is post truth. So we li- so uh we really what he means by post truth is like we we uh, we live in we, like we we live in a manner that doesn't associate with truth or with reality. We live post truth. We live we live beyond truth. So uh, he and he's he used the Book of Mormon as a reference. I didn't throw that in there. Just gonna throw that out there. Um. We learn to respect holy books the exact same way we, re- we learn to respect paper currency by constant exposure to people who say it's actually valuable. But the Bible doesn't have any inherent value, just like paper currency or, or metal coins. They don't have any inherent value. We just decide and agree that they have value. It's not it, but if you if you live your life chasing after the tech, you know after religious texts and religious books or currency or national pride, you'll be disappointed because those things aren't real and they don't provide any actual value. They don't, in, they don't actually increase the quality of your life. Sports, currency, holy books, and stories, corporations require us to suspend belief. I threw that fucking ants. I'm sorry, guys. I'm, fucked up these notes sports currency holy books stories and corporations require us to suspend belief and then believe two rules of thumb to avoid brainwashing and distinguish reality from fiction the first if you want reliable information pay good money for it if you are willing to pay for high this is a quote if you are willing to pay for high quality food clothes and cars why aren't you willing to pay for high quality information? Again, like we said earlier, if you do not pay for the thing, you are likely the product of the thing. We don't pay for any social media. We don't pay for a lot of our news. Fox, CNN, uh, uh, you know, the Daily Mail, things that things that get uh, we can like just do it with a basic Google search. That kind of news. Uh, that's free. That's freely accessible. I mean, there's an argument to be said about about news being freely available, but the the issue again here is because it's free, you'll find a decrease in in quality. And if you go to any news site right now and read an art, try to read an article, you'll be bombarded with advertisements. So why not pay ten bucks, fifteen bucks, five bucks a month for a high quality news source, and then this is the capitalist in me. If you if you make or require all media to be, you know, to 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 charge, they will be competing with each other to provide the highest quality information with the most integrity. And then that's the that's the media that's gonna win. The highest quality with the most integrity. So that's the first way to avoid brainwashing. Pay for reliable information. And two, if you if an issue seems exceptionally important to you, make an effort to read the relevant scientific literature. Don't just take anything at face value. And don't be like me. When you see the liver king and you're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to take liver pills because that's going to make me healthier. Uh, go do the actual scientific reading. Peer-reviewed uh, research. Go read those papers and see what, you know, see what the science says. You go see what the truth is. Go see what reality is. Don't live in your... You, like you can live in your own imaginary world, but you're then you're living in a post-truth world. You're living just like a, you know you're like you're igno- you're being irresponsible. You're being irresponsible living that way. Go seek the truth. Part five, final part, baby. Let's wrap this up. Part five, resilience. Chapter nineteen, education. In a world where all kinds of information and misinformation are accessible at the touch of a screen, what we need more of is not more information, but the ability to discern between information and informa- and misinformation. 
Uh, how true is that, man? We need like we have at the touch of our at the touch of a screen the ability to access, and I've done it several times already just on this podcast, googling uh, facts or data or statistics, and who knows if anything that I read was actually true? If it reflects what's really happening in the world, who knows? We just trust Google, like a, like we like I could spend I, I could spend real time after this podcast compiling data and analyzing a bunch of statistics from and going out into the world and interviewing people and to find the real numbers to get the numbers as close as to the truth as possible but we now we just trust Google to do it like people have done it some research or they've done no research and they're bullshitting it the point is we have so much information available to us now it's not a matter of getting more information what's more important is our ability to discern information from misinformation Pedagogical, pedagogical experts, and uh, that means people relating to teaching. So teaching experts suggest that we should teach kids the four C's. Critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity. We should teach fewer technical skills and more general purpose life skills. How to deal with change and how to learn new things. Critical thinking, communication, collaboration, creativity. These things are more valuable uh, to a person today than being able to access all kinds of information, information because anybody can access information. But how many of us can discern – well, there's like the ability to discern truth from fiction initially. But how, do you, how many of us can sp- are able and willing to spend time with a topic to understand all of the complexities of, a, of the topic – Find out what's fiction, spend time with the fiction, understand why it's the fiction so that you can actually understand the truth. Not a lot of people are doing that, I would argue. I would say most people just take what they hear and if they like it, they run with it, but they don't do any research about it. And I've done that too. I'm a victim of that. I'm totally a victim of that. I don't research everything that I hear. You know, I, I could like read this book. I'm, I'm doing it right now. I could read this book. I should go do all the data about all these points that I'm making. That he's making, he cites all of his sources. That's why. That's why I feel confident taking his word for it because it's it's not just him bullshitting. He's got how many pages of citation? Let me see. I'm gonna just I'm gonna do it because I think it's valuable. He has from page three three one to page three five eight. So 27 pages of citation. He's not just he's not just fucking around, you know. He's done a lot his, him and his team have done all the re, not all, a lot of research to make these points. They're not he's not bullshitting it. And a lot of the a lot of the books that I read do. They're high they're high quality books, most of them, not all of them. And uh so that's why I feel confident just sharing the data and then and like and then trying my best to integrate it into my way of thinking because it's it's like mostly true, right? It's like it's reality. So anyway, the ability to critical think, communicate, collaborate, and to be creative are more, will be more valuable in the future than technical skills. Uh, we are living in an arms race to understand ourselves better than computers and algorithms. If we don't use technology to serve our purposes and we don't even know what our own purposes are, Technology will use us to serve its own purposes. If you want to attempt to understand yourself better than Amazon, Google, Facebook, etc., discard all illusions about yourself and in the world. They will only hold you back. This br- and this this brings us to chapter twenty, which is meaning. So, uh, like we've discussed, all of these tech companies—not all, most of these tech companies are doing everything they can to collect our data because he he who owns the data rules the world, will rule the world. It will be more significant than any other inequality gap in history. So everybody's trying to collect our data because they're trying to decide and they're, they're like organizing what we like from our data. You know, summarizing the whole book basically. Data collects what we like and then these companies sell that data so that they can target so that other companies can target us because they know what we like 
bef- maybe maybe without us even knowing that we like it. Um, the solution to this is we got to learn how to know ourselves, man. We got to spend time with ourselves. We got to consider what we like and what we don't like. We have to go out into the world. We have to put our phones away. We have to remove distractions. We have got to be aware of what's sucking our attention or else we're going to be a victim of this kind of att- attention trap from these tech companies. So if you want to attempt to understand yourself better than Amazon, Google, Facebook, etc., discard all illusions about yourself and the world. Stop living in a post-truth world. Stop discarding the truth or ignoring the truth because you want to fit your own biases or you want to you want to just or just live in ignorance and bliss. Um, those things will hold you back from understanding truth and being uh, being a a tool for goodness and and innovation in the world. All right, let's talk about twenty. It was the longest chapter of the book. Meaning. Humans are storytelling creatures searching to understand the meaning of the universe purpose of our lives, where we came from, why we're here, and where we're going. Uh, yeah, we're storytelling creatures. We're, we've always been trying to create and understand our own meaning. Uh, so that's why we. That's one reason why religions have been established, culture, rituals, governments, because we want to. We want to feel meaning in the world, and we want to know that what like our lives and the death of loved ones and suffering has like a purpose that we're not just experiencing suffering for nothing. So we've just so we've create we've put like when your family gets like if you were medieval Europe and your family got the black plague or the bubonic plague, and they all died and you survived. You want to you want to like it, it's comforting to think that uh, they are with God and they're at peace now. They're not suffering rather than saying that they lived their life and they, and they died tragically and they were in a bunch of pain and then that was it and then now they're just dis- now they're just gone like that's that's a really pessimistic point of view but again in my opinion that's reality we could and, and then this but we're going to talk about how to establish meaning at, from a secular point of view so the basics to experiencing meaning in life, the ver- the fundamentals are your s- the story you believe must give you some role to play, and the story must extend beyond you and your what, y- you and I think I meant to say your life, but it doesn't need to be infinity. Like the Mormon story is an infinite story. There was God for infinity before. There was God. There will be God in you for infinity. Infinity from here on out. Your story to experience meaning doesn't need to be infinity. Just because your story is longer doesn't make it more meaningful. So let's keep going. The idea that you need to leave something meaningful behind after you die to find meaning while you're alive is paradoxical. Since after you die, there's no way of reaping the reward of the thing. And I read that this morning. That's awesome. I read that from uh, Ryan Holiday's... Uh, daily stoic blog he he shared and it was funny he used a he used a death cap for cutie quote uh from a song um like everybody that's ever created anything will die and you know what's the point of of and i guess i started the podcast with it what's the point of achieving fame if we're all gonna die and then when you're dead what's the point of like having the fame you know jesus is probably the most iconic figure like the most popular over time person ever. But what good is that doing him at this point? You know, all it, do- all it has done since he died is cause a whole bunch of problems. And maybe it gave some people peace and it's still, and he still gives some people peace and meaning, but he's caused a lot of problems. And I bet Jesus would be so bugged about that, that he is, that he, that he was the source of so much suffering or that Buddha he shares, uh, you know, you think Buddha, the story of Buddhism and Hinduism is all uh, hunky dory, and there's like they have similar, uh, they have similar. Uh, Hinduism and Christianity share problems where uh, there's a what's the like the Crusades, like the 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 Christian Crusades, there were Buddhist and Hindu kings and emperors that killed and tortured so many people in the name of Buddha. Like all religion, I bet Buddha would be pissed. I would be pissed if I tried to promote peace and ending suffering. But motherfuckers 
used my name to cause pain and suffering on other people. I would be so bugged. But that's, you know, that's not Jesus' fault or Buddha's fault. That's the fault of these dumbasses, right? Uh, so what was I saying? <laughs> the idea that you need to leave something behind me, that's meaningful after you die to feel meaning in your life while you're alive is paradoxical. Yeah, because when you're dead, there's no way of reaping the reward. So yeah, so Jesus has caused – people have done horrendous things in the name of Jesus or in the name of Buddha, but that's not their concern anymore. They're dead, and we're all going to die. So that's why instead of just doing whatever we want, I think we should do – like be the most responsible now. Do the very best to be the very best that we can today. I think that's the best way to interpret that. Anyone that provides a story for the meaning of life is wrong. There is no concrete meaning that applies to every person. I already kind of explained this. If you have a story that says you have the full truth, uh, if you claim infallibility, you lose credibility. Bam. Put my name on that. Put it in a fucking uh, – put it in a fortune cookie. I don't give a fuck. Okay. We make fictional stories to feel real through, through rituals. We make fictional stories – feel real through rituals god you know and i know why it does this because i do the text to text to speech to make my notes sometimes i'm driving or sometimes there's a big note and so i just it's quicker so I, I don't even know what i was trying to say we make fictional stories feel real oh oh no i i'm stupid that was right we make uh, the fictional stories that we believe feel real to us through the rituals we perform. There you go. There's an elaboration. Rites and rituals are an obstacle to truth, and truth is a liability to social stability, harmony, and cohesion. You see how that goes? Just like, like the organization of nationalism had created, a, it did a bunch of great things. It established, it, it incentivized innovation, and uh, liberate uh, uh, promoted the liberal agenda that gave people meaning and. And ended a lot of suffering. However, it's based on a lot of fiction. Most of, well, nationalism is based on fiction because nations aren't real. But the idea of a nation being real uh, gives people some, it gives some people meaning and relieves some suffering. But if you were, and then the, on the flip side, if you were to only live in a world of truth, uh, uh, he says truth is a liability to social stability, harmony, and cohesion because. Um, well, I don't, I don't even think all humans are capable of only living in truth. We're like, we're, we're semi designed to live in fiction and to, and to associate meaning where there is no meaning because it helps us feel better and make good decisions, better decisions. That's why, again, I will say it again. I, I will not dissuade people from believing in a in god or in religion if it makes you a better person and in, increases like your your peace and well-being in those of your family and loved ones and uh you don't cause any harm to other people um the most potent ritual is sacrifice quote want to suffer for a story it is easier to believe in the story that the story is real if you suffer for a story it is easier to believe the story is real Either the story is true, or you're terribly gullible, or you're a terrible villain. So either, you know, like for the Christians, right? For the Crusades. Either the story is true, and your Crusades were justified, will be justified in heaven, or you're terribly gullible, or you're a terrible villain for subjecting so many people to so much pain and heartache. So if you're going to cause suffering, like you, like... <laughs> That's and that's how people justify doing horrendous shit is because it's for a greater cause. And he sh and he shared a funny example where, um, there were I can't remember ex well, I actually don't remember all the details, but some uh terrorists were killed in a drone bombing or something like this, and the terrorists responded saying it doesn't matter because those people because you killed them they're going to heaven. But we're still going to retaliate and we're still going to fight against you, you know. Uh, and he says this, it's, it's, uh, it's ironic that what, what was done to your people gave them 
the ultimate bliss, right? Why would you be upset? Why would anybody be upset about that? And if you're a Christian and you actually and you and the Pope says if you go fight for me and you die, you'll be sent straight to heaven and enjoy eternal bliss. And then <laughs> well then why would you even go fight? Or no, why why would you even care about surviving? Why would you care to survive if death brought something far greater than surviving? Huh? Why? Why would you care about, and why would the Pope care about, if that was the case, why wouldn't everybody just go be a martyr? Why wouldn't everybody go out and die for this cause? Because going to heaven is way better than surviving. But it's because it's not true. Because the story helps people fight against, and, and, and if your loved one dies, then you don't need to be sad because now they get to, they get to enjoy eternal bliss. So, anyway. Quote, nothing is inherently beautiful, sacred, or sexy. Human feelings make it so. It is only human feelings that make a red apple seductive and a piece of turd disgusting. Take away human feelings and you are only left with a bunch of molecules. And then I said, read the second paragraph on page 305. So I'm going to do that really fast. Go to 305, second paragraph. We hope to find meaning by fitting ourselves into some ready-made story about the universe. But according to the liberal interpretation of the world, the truth is exactly the opposite. The universe does not give me meaning. I give me, I give meaning to the universe. This is my cosmic vocation. I have no fixed destiny or dharma. If I find myself in Simba's or Arjuna's shoes, I can choose to fight for the crown of the kingdom. But I do not have to. I can just as well join a wandering circus, go to a Broadway to sing in a musical, or move to Silicon Valley and launch a startup. I am free to create my dharma. We get to create. We don't get to choose what turns us on. Again, we're bio biochemical chem, organisms, and we respond to our environment based on how our our, ba- our brain chemistry. But we get to choose how to react. And because there is no inherent meaning in the universe, we get to create the meaning. We get to decide what that meaning is. I've recommended it before. Go watch Optimistic Nihilism. Wait. Yeah. Optimistic Nihilism by Kurtzkazart on YouTube. That's my – That's I, I vibe with that entire philosophy. Even free will only exists regarding when it – when it comes to the freedom to do what you desire. We still do not get to choose our d- desires. We do not, yeah, I just said that. Uh, p- uh, page 308, another great quote. This is about, you are not your thoughts. And it's, you know, it's awesome that it's, we hear that, you are not your thoughts, from scientists and from philosophers all the time. They all say it. But here's a scientist and a historian saying it. Page 308, last paragraph. If you really want to understand yourself, you should not identify with your Facebook account or with the inner story of the self. Instead, you should observe the actual flow of body and mind. You will see thoughts, emotions, and desires appear and disappear without much reason and without any command from you, just as different winds blow from this or that direction and mess up your hair. And just as you are not the winds, so also you are not the jumble of thoughts, emotions, and desires you experience. You are certainly not the sanitized story you tell about them with hindsight. You experience all of them, but you don't control them. You don't own them, and you are not them. People ask, who am I? And expect to be told a story. The first thing you need to know about yourself is that you are not a story could end the book on that that's beautiful you are not your thoughts you are not a story you are you are experiences from moment to moment Uh, a couple more thoughts on this chapter and then we're moving on to the last chapter can the central hero of your story suffer for example can america suffer no can its people yes can your religion suffer no jesus supposedly did but god cannot and neither can like catholicism or mormonism or like as an organization cannot suffer but can the people yes perhaps the people and their well-being are more important than the interests of the entity of the religion nations currency etc period period okay let's move on last chapter 21 meditation i think it was the shortest chapter so this should be should should be brief 
Meditation is observing moment to moment. It's living in the present. I talk tons about living in the present, not living in the past or the future. The deepest sources of suffering are in the patterns of our minds. That's it. Suffering only exists in our minds. It does not exist in the world. Organiz- your organization doesn't suffer. Only your mind does for the organization. When we're angry, we tend to think about the thing we're angry about instead of observing our minds and bodies. Interesting. Suffering is only in the minds. Nations, governments, currencies, and religions don't suffer. Yes. Quote, the actual practice is to observe body sensations and mental reactions to sensations in a methodical, continuous, and objective manner, thereby uncovering the basic patterns of the mind. Uh, yes. So um, meditation is, the actual practice of meditation is to observe the body sensations and mental reactions to sensations in a methodical, continuous, and objective manner, thereby understanding the basic patterns of the mind, of your mind, understanding what goes on in your brain, not fighting them, but allowing your thoughts to come in, sitting with them for as long as they're there, and then watching them leave and watching the next thought come in. That's meditation. And uh, uh, that's the end of the, that's, that's the end of the book. I found at the, at the end of, the, uh, just from a quick Google search from insider.com, um, a few different ways to meditate. Cause meditate, you know, it, meditation can be, it can it can be a lot of different things, and I think for the lay person, it sounds like a meditation is sitting down in in full lotus with the lights off and an in, incense burning, and your uh, eyes closed, and you got rainforest playing, and you're like your thought, your brain is no, your brain is not mindless or thoughtless. You don't need to be sitting in a dark room with incense burning and in the full lotus position. Meditation can come in several different ways, and really, uh, the like, find the f- find the form of meditation that works the best for you. It's better to meditate in any capacity than it is to not meditate. <laughs> whether you're able to sit in deep rest for two hours and observe your mind, or whether it's five to fifteen minutes of like of reading a book. And so, okay, so from Insider.com, the five most common types of meditation. Uh, that they share mindfulness meditation mindfulness meditation is the basic act of being aware or mindful or of what you're doing in the present moment for example you could be practicing mindfulness while you were walking your dog brushing your teeth or washing your dishes that's mindful it's removing the distractions right it's like eating dinner but not being distracted with tv or music or social media so there's mindfulness meditation there's body scan meditation um, focus on consciously relaxing different parts of the body. So you're sitting on a couch and f- and, f- and then like paying, a- paying attention to your arms, to your legs, to the rise and the fall of your chest, to your shoulders, to your eyelids, to your cheeks, you know, to your nose, to your forehead. Do you scrunch your forehead? Body scan meditation. There's walking meditation. Uh, walking meditation encourages you to focus on each footstep in order to be fully present. Uh, loving kindness meditation is described as uh, geared toward cultivating compassion for yourself and others by like repeating loving kindness mantras or positive affirmations. And this one I thought was interesting. I've never heard of transcendental meditation. It involves focusing on the specific mantra or phrase by repeating it during meditation. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, of course I've heard of this. Yeah, like repeating Om or repeating I am worthy. <laughs> That's transcendental meditation. So there's lots of different ways to med- meditate. And the most important thing is that you actually do it. It helps you understand who you are, right? If you want to beat big tech at understanding yourself so that you can take control of your life and make decisions that positively impact your life and those around you, you got to start by understanding yourself. You got to meditate. You got to write and journal and contemplate. Uh, what what interests you, what doesn't interest you, and then maybe even supplement it with the technology. Supplement it with the the data that you get, or that social media and big data, big tech companies pull from you. You use both, but you got to start by like wanting to be aware of what you like and what you don't like yourself. Oh, geez, that was crazy, man. That was twenty one lessons for the twenty first century by Yuval Noah Harari. Yeah, we're two and a half hours almost in. Definitely going to break that up into two parts. 
Uh, thanks for tuning. If you listen to all of this, thank you so much. I hope you gain so much uh, inspiration and wisdom from all of this because I think the, I think his lessons are really, really uh, impactful and important. We're going to go back to a classic for next week or for this week. We're going to read The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck by Mark Manson, A Counterintuitive Approach to Living a Good Life. I think we read that like a year ago, and I think that one is worth revisiting. So that's what we're going to do next week. If you want to join that conversation live, go to the blog, kadenkellysblog.wordpress.com. Find the Facebook, YouTube, or Twitch links. You can uh, follow me. Turn on your notifications. You'll get notified when we go live on Monday. Um, and then read the blog. You know, Watch the TikToks if you want to get more content from all of this and to help improve your life. Make better decisions. For the present moment. For the 21st century, baby. That's what this was all about. So thanks for tuning in. We'll see you on the next one, guys. Have a good one.